listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Germany's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Hello, everyone. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin. And today's episode is one that I have been excited about for quite a while. One of the top requests that I get is to revisit one of my old podcast very first episodes. For those of you who are not aware, I had a horror podcast over 10 years ago called All Horror. We actually did really well for ourselves, and I got to discuss what I love most, which is horror movies, or movies deemed too extreme or too taboo for general consumption. I found that luckily, there is a great deal of overlap between the worlds of true crime and horror, and you may have noticed the injection of horror into some of our episodes here on We Saw the Devil, uh, especially lately, like in the last month or so. The episode that I am referring to specifically is an episode on a documentary film called Graphic Sexual Horror. Some of you may have listened to that old episode. I mean, it was up for quite a while, and it's like 12 years old. In that episode, I and my two other co-hosts at the time discussed this film at length. The cover art alone is something that will burrow into your psyche and plant itself there for the rest of your life. It's not a horror movie, but it's actually just a documentary on one of the most controversial pornography companies of the last 30 years, Insects. Now, you may be wondering why I'm going to be covering a porn site My reason for this is threefold. First, it's one of our top requests. Secondly, Insex was actually shut down in 2005 by the Department of Homeland Security. Third, there is an unmistakable link between violent pornography and violent offenders. Now, I'm not saying that it's a causal relationship, mind you, but there is a definite link between the two. And allow me to make it very, very clear starting out here. Insex wasn't a website where women were casually tied up with a rope, engaged in whatever sexual act, and then giggled as the scene cut. This wasn't Betty Page level 1950s smut. I cannot stress enough how violent and shocking it is. The women were actually physically tortured in almost every single way imaginable and left with temporary injuries, cuts, and bruising. It quite literally looks like it was made by a serial killer. Think of the raunchiest porn that you've somehow ever witnessed or come across, maybe even just kink.com, which is, I guess, one of the the more popular ones. Insects made them look like Care Bears. So seriously, it is really, really weird and dark stuff. First, I would like to give a shout out to our Patreon patrons because our true crime gift of the month, I bestowed this documentary onto them. And this is a documentary. I hadn't seen it in quite a while, probably seven or eight years. I actually own the special edition because I'm so fascinated by it. And it's just such a really just raw and visceral documentary. So I bestowed this documentary upon our patrons and forgot that there's, you know, a great deal of constant nudity and BDSM and naked women. And it's just, it was a mess. So kudos to all of our patrons for watching it processing it and actually coming back with some really good questions and observations because I I, I watched it myself again. I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that, but it's all right. So first, before we get into discussing the film, let's just lay down a baseline and talk about porn and a brief history of its legal status here in the United States. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, U.S. states were seeing scores of lawsuits testing local obscenity laws. In a major case, Jacob Ellis v. Ohio, a movie theater owner was charged with possessing and exhibiting an explicit film. Ohio's state Supreme Court was more or less like, ah, we don't effing know. 
Because of that, and no one could clearly define what pornography was, what obscene material was, a lot of these lawsuits popped up. One in particular in California made it to the actual United States Supreme Court after a publisher was convicted of distributing obscene materials. The Supreme Court ended up upholding his conviction, but also finally laid out the basic guidelines for jurors in obscenity cases across the board throughout the country. So these included three different points. One, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find the work taken as a whole appeals to community interest. Two, whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law. Three, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. The Supreme Court reasoned that individuals could not be convicted of obscenity charges unless the materials depict patently offensive, hardcore sexual conduct. This means that many materials dealing with sex, including pornographic magazines, books, and movies, simply do not qualify as legally obscene. So after the 1960s, like early and mid-1960s, we started to see a lot fewer of these obscenity law lawsuits popping up. And that's actually an, a full episode by itself as far as like the history of pornography in this country. But this is still one of the guidelines used to judge obscene materials in this country. And it's actually very, on a grand scale, we don't see it pop up as much as we did. That's pretty much where we will stop with this three-pronged definition of the basic guidelines for, for jurors and obscenity cases and how to judge it. I would also like to take a moment and state for the record that I am not attempting to make some overstated correlation or attempt to show causation between violent porn and crime. I mean, let's be honest, people, who among us hasn't watched porn? One in five mobile phone searches is for porn. And in one large survey, 98% of over 4,000 men reported having watched porn at least once. And the number is staggering for women as well, somewhere I think like 74%. So I just want to make it explicitly clear where I stand on this. So let's get into the movie itself. And this is directly from the back of the DVD case. Quote, if you won't allow me to teach your children, then I will corrupt them. And that is a direct quote from Brent Scott, creator of Insects.com. In 1997, a former professor at Carnegie Mellon University started a phenomenon. The website he created, Insects.com, was devoted to bondage, fetish, and sadomasochistic scenarios. By the time the site was shut down by the Department of Homeland Security, it had 35,000 members who paid $60 a month to view its content. An often raw and shocking documentary, Graphic Sexual Horror is a fascinating look at the rise and fall of the world's most notorious violent porn website and an exploration into the dark mind of its artistic creator, Brent Scott, aka PD. Containing original insects.com behind-the-scenes footage and candid interviews with PD, the models, members, and staff, this film almost dares you to watch, assaulting the eyes from its opening frames with violent images of moaning, crying women, bound, tortured, and terrorized. And that sounds really kind of overly dramatic, I think, to to the everyday person, but it's not. That is actually a very, very, I would say, accurately written description of this film. What I find most interesting about this movie is that it was created and directed by Barbara Bell and Anna Lorenston. Anna Lorenston was actually a model-turned-producer for Insects itself. And Barbara Bell was a novelist. So between the two of them, this film is a fascinating documentary with an incredible amount of insights uh, with the models who participated with insects. And it has an incredible amount of behind the scenes footage. Lorelai Lee and Princess Donna are are two very well-known, near legendary figures in the BDSM scene. And both got their start as models at insects. This film shows nearly every aspect of insects from its early work Uh, new models, their interviews, and live and recorded shoots and recollections. Color me boring and vanilla, I guess, but I'm not into this stuff at all personally. And I'm not one to kink shame, 
at all. And I think why I'm so fascinated by this documentary and topic in particular is because so many of the women who did such extreme acts did so because they felt empowered by it. I'll very briefly touch on the varying schools of feminism in a moment, but for me personally, insects and the materials that it created, it walks such a fine line, guys. I am one of the most anti-censorship people you will ever meet, yet I'm also a major true crime junkie. And it's actually kind of disturbing knowing that tens of thousands of everyday people are paying large amounts of money, more or less to masturbate to porn that is quite literally out of a serial killer's handbook. And this is probably my own preconceived notions and assumptions on this, but I, that's, just, that's just where I'm at, okay? The film does not directly ask the viewer questions about the morality of insects, uh, BDSM, or pornography in general nor does it actually pass judgment on P.D., the creator, or his work. It just simply asks you to draw your own conclusions. So let's get into the documentary. Brent Scott was the founder of Insects, and the film obviously begins with him and his origin story. He went by the name P.D., so that is how I will refer to him from here on out in this episode. Once, when he was a young boy, around 9 or 10 years old, he was playing outside with his cousins. And two of his female cousins loved Wonder Woman, and they had the whole costume for her, the hair, the outfit, the whip. So one day as he was playing with them, they tied him up and tickled him. You know, just run-of-the-mill childhood play. He recalls having to urinate pretty badly and thought that he was about to pee himself. Well, he didn't pee himself. He had actually orgasmed for the very first time. And he describes how as he got older, he would seek out bondage magazines or even advertisements showing women in bras or anything that made them look distressed or uncomfortable. He ended up being drafted into the Vietnam War and while stationed in Japan, went out to a restaurant with fellow soldiers one night. The hostesses were wearing beautiful kimonos and everything appeared to be just, you know, a normal dinner. That is until a man grabbed one of the hostesses, brought her on stage and slowly disrobed her. PD was shocked, but watched as they tied her up with ropes and put her on display. And he would later learn that he witnessed a form of Japanese bondage theater utilizing shibari, which is a method of Japanese rope bondage and how they tie the ropes and things like that. It's very cere- apparently very ceremonial. So after the Vietnam War, PD came back and then went to college. And while working on his undergraduate degree, PD became obsessed with BDSM. I mean, he already was, but he was actually an adult now and able to, you know, more so act on it. Having had an interest in painting since he was young, his obsession was put to canvas. He began to paint. All of his paintings reflected his obsession with BDSM. The clips they display in the documentary show handfuls of darkly tinted paintings showing women in various positions, all naked and tied up with either ropes or leather hoods or high heels. PD at that moment realized that he wanted to dominate and torture women. So he got married and shortly after the wedding, he began to work on his master's degree. And during this time, he had a BDSM playroom Literally, he had a BDSM playroom in his attic. His wife apparently wasn't into this scene whatsoever. So he just had his own little, um, as apparently he considers himself a dom, he had his own little playroom in the attic. So what he would do is he would place ads looking for fetish models who were into BDSM and then brought the said models home to photograph them. He would tie them up in shibari put hoods over their faces or heads, or just pose them into physically compromising positions. And at first, it was actually about the photography. He ended up becoming a professor of art at Carnegie Mellon University, and the university was well aware of all of his side projects. His entire portfolio and ongoing work at that time was solely focused on and dedicated to hardcore BDSM, And that's like another crazy piece to me is imagine this incredible university and the art teacher, one of the art professors, literally his life's work is drawing pictures of women with those like, you know, leather hoods over their heads or being restrained or kept in a cage. 
That was his artwork. And Carnegie Mellon was like, yeah, sweet dude, bring it on. Also during this time, uh, Petey became very frustrated with the fact that he was married and couldn't sexually interact with the models. So he made a deal with his wife. He would be allowed to manually stimulate and masturbate the actresses to orgasm, but they could not touch him. So that's what he did. He would suspend a girl from the ceiling or put her on a, a forged crucifix. He would spank or cane her and then stimulate her to orgasm. He would also photograph and video all of this. At this point, this was pretty much consuming all of his free time, and he was utterly disgusted with his regular nine to five life and being a professor at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, He had credit card debt piling up, and he was just overall miserable. And with the internet, anything was possible. So he took the remainder of his, his credit, plus his entire life savings, and he decided to create and found a BDSM website. He named it Insects, which he, with no apparent explanation, says is a play on the word insects, like bugs. Now, in this documentary, it actually interviews and has a panel of people who worked for insects. We have everything from men, women, riggers, set designers, people like that. So the very first person that's up is Sid Black, and he became a rigger for insects or a handler as well. And he said this about the discovery of insects when he was in college. He said, quote, when I came across insects, there was something kind of serial killery about them. Very grainy, gritty, very dark. I'd never seen anything like it. I couldn't tell if it was real or not. It looked like the guy really could have gone out, captured some girls, taken them back to his apartment and done whatever he wanted to to them. Sid was a broke college student who had a fetish for extreme BDSM. He said that he happily gave up beer and food money to pay the $60 monthly subscription fee to the service. To put that into perspective, in the mid-90s, a $60 subscription fee was the equivalent of $104 today. For a college student, that was, an actual, that was a substantial amount of money. Sid becomes an interviewed subject in the film, offering information and observations from his time with insects. Another key interesting piece to me is that when asked if insects was porn, PD, the creator, replied and said, no, absolutely not. It's art. And that quote then transitions to Barry Goldman, another former insects employee who sleazily comes across as your stereotypical porn producer, even though he wasn't. He says, quote, directly, fucking A, it was porn. And Barry, unsurprisingly, advised Brent to get a wide variety of models in terms of ethnicities and backgrounds. That is something that PD maintains to this day, is that Insects wasn't just a pornographic website. He considered himself to be an actual artist. In the world of BDSM, he considered himself to be an artist, not only in coming up with ways to torture the models and display them, degrade them, but also his artwork, his photography. You know, he put initially a lot of thought and and time into framing the shots, what he wanted it to look like and things like that. The film then shows different video clips from the earliest period of insects, including numerous clips of models who responded to ads and then came in to be interviewed. They were asked their size, their sexual interests, Uh, their level of exposure to BDSM, as well as their hard limits. Now, a hard limit uh, when dealing with the porn industry is basically a limit that you have. I will do everything up to this point. You know, slapping me is my hard limit. I do not want that. That will like I will be done. Like that is my hard, absolutely not limit. So that is something that PD always started off with in the interviews is asking the girls what their hard limits would be. And that was actually fascinating as well, because there were so many different types of women who showed up to this stuff. Uh, There were women who were looking for just fast, easy sex work, easy being completely subjective there. Uh, There were alternative women wearing dog collars and, and leather and chains who were already deep into the BDSM community. And then there were also feminists and intellectuals. I mean, some of these women were even doctoral candidates at Ivy League universities. Some of them believed that modeling for insects was a great way to reclaim their own sexuality on their own terms. There were countless reasons why women applied to the ads and wanted to be on screen. 
One model explained it that because the nature of it was so extreme and could actually, in fact, lead to physical injury, uh, she felt like she was reclaiming her own sexuality because she was solely in charge of it herself. Only she could say her safe word and get out of that particular predicament, that situation that she was in. So she felt like she ultimately held that power. Some of the women are now quite well known. There's Lorelai Lee, who became a successful BDSM model and actress, and even more recently did a Hollywood film called About Cherry with James Franco, Lily Taylor, and Heather Graham. She graduated from San Francisco State University in 2008 and later pursued a master's degree in creative writing at NYU, New York University. She's highly intelligent and articulate, is a highly awarded writer, and has produced several of her own documentary films. Uh, Then there's Princess Donna, who is considered an an absolute legend in the adult entertainment industry. She, like Lee, began to model at NSEX while an undergrad at New York University, later enrolling in the prestigious Tisch School of Art, which is incredibly, incredibly difficult to get into. She gained employment uh, at NSEX, became one of the most popular models, and then later ended up working at the notorious kink.com for several years, uh, leaving in 2014 to become a sex-positive educator and writer. The film hammers home that every single model was treated with respect, decency, and had their hard limits respected. And that is until they weren't, but we will tackle that as this episode goes on. Perhaps the most disturbing piece of this film is an interview with Model 101. That is her name, Model 101. What happened is PD quickly discovered that because insects grew so quickly, so fast, any model who came onto insects could leave, use insects in their resume and their porn name. I mean, for lack of a better description, their porn name. So he decided, that's bad for business. I'm going to give the models numbers. So say model, you know, model 101, the the month that she came in for her test screening, followed by like the day. So 101 would be like January 1st. So that's actually how he numbered them. I mean, incredibly, you know, bold business decision there. But we can't deny the symbolism of assigning these women numbers instead of names. Model 101 is sincerely depressing because the film actually shows footage of her from her college years back in the mid-1990s. And she was beautiful, vivacious, full of life. Her eyes lit up and she was very articulate. She was a college student with a minor drug habit uh, who was interested in BDSM. She joined in sex solely for the money and was so popular that PD asked her to become a resident model. Now, a resident model was one that lived at the facility and more or less became PD's full-time plaything after the camera stopped rolling. You see, PD's wife had ended up divorcing him because he changed as a person after the official founding and success of insects. He was now free to sexually harass or engage in any various activities with any of the willing models off camera. And Model 101 became his girlfriend. It's quite shocking as the film transitions from footage of her bright-eyed and beautiful to how she ended up post sex. She slipped into complete drug addiction homelessness, and had multiple psychiatric hospitalizations. You know, she's sitting on a dirty, ripped up armchair. She's taking these long draws off a cigarette. She's got that thousand yard stare like she was in Vietnam and had just witnessed like her friends blow apart. She ends up saying as she's staring just off into space, the torture stuff was a release. It dissipated the depression a little bit. And it's chilling. It's sincerely chilling. While doing research for this episode, I actually found an article that Model 101 had written discussing her life and time at insects. She described a childhood filled with physical, sexual, and emotional abuse and how it led to her feeling worthless. And she ended up actually getting into a sexual and romantic relationship with PD, uh, which included being a 24-7 sub to PD's dom. And what he subjected her to off camera is more graphic than even I feel comfortable discussing here on this podcast. I mean, it's just absolutely depraved what he did to her. 
And you look at her now and she is just an absolute shell of a human being. Now, insects was unique for a couple different reasons. First, it was the most extreme porn that you could find on the internet at the time. Secondly, again, the models didn't have names. They had numbers, which made a huge difference. And third, the website had photographs, video, and live feeds. And the live feeds were without a doubt the biggest draw. Models would do live sessions, which back in 1995, 99, 2000 was incredibly unique. And these were really, really, really rough. Now, what you have to understand about insects is that the models weren't there you know, every week or, or doing shoots. They had one model come and she would come from somewhere all across the country. Most of these models didn't even live locally to the insects compound in New York City because what they did left them with scarring, bruising uh, and pain. They would have to pick a model and then do a shoot with her and then she would have to have months to physically recover from it. So the live feed was especially, especially bad. Uh, The sessions would last anywhere from three hours to 48 hours in total, just depending. There was a chat room on the page, and that chat room was actually projected onto a wall of the set that they were using so that everyone can see it at any time. An electronic voice read out all of the comments coming from subscribers. And people could pay for and request any sort of torture or action to be given to the model at any time. The live feeds would inevitably be the most extreme because of this. And obviously, the result of that is that it brought in the most money. Women had their breasts and nipples pierced. They were caned until they bled. They were slapped, punched, suffocated with plastic bags, urinated or defecated on, had medical instruments inserted into their vaginas. Pens, like sewing pens, inserted beneath their fingernails halfway up the nail bed and penetrated with a variety of crudely fashioned sex toys. It was incredibly violent. And at its height, over 35,000 people paid to see these women utterly destroyed. And like me, you may be thinking, why in the hell did these women voluntarily sign up for that? In one word, money. The models were always paid extremely well. The base rate for even just a photo shoot was $300 an hour. For a live feed at that rate, a model could make anywhere from $300 up to $15,000 in a single weekend. Using inflation, that's between $500 and $27,000 over the course of two days. The more violently they allowed themselves to be abused, the more money they made. In a quote that was particularly telling, at least to me, PD reflected on his own interests. He said, quote, I've always been aware of the fact that this could be used as some kind of tutorial for some sick freak out there, like the gags I apply to girls. But then at the same time, I was influenced by criminal freaks. DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler, they would pose the girls, the Hillside Strangler, I know these guys, these serial killers, and the ones who are the most fascinating to me are the ones who used bondage. Cameron Hooker was, in fact, the bondage freak who became criminal. Petey actually hired a full-time builder and welder in order to create different contraptions and set pieces for his films, and that was another thing that set them apart. Some of these were metal high heels that looked industrial or, or painful, Others were crucifixes, metal cages, posts, tanks. He would, and this is factual, look at serial killer material available online and then have his builder make it. And from his own admission, one of, his bi- one of the biggest examples of this was sadist Cameron Hooker, who kidnapped Colleen Stan and imprisoned her in a coffin-like box under his and his wife's bed for over seven years. He had an extreme BDSM fetish, kidnapped Colleen, and then built various contraptions in which to torture her. PD recreated one of his boxes for his shoots at Insects. He also has a love for horror films, such as The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Last House on the Left. He claims that horror movies exploit violence, so why is what he's doing any different? That's his logic. Midway through the documentary, though, the cracks begin to show. PD neglected safety protocols, leading to an eight-foot-tall tank of water framed by only three-quarter-inch glass 
shattering during a shoot with a model restrained and submerged inside. They have a tank. It's about eight feet tall, this tank in particular. They are actually dunking her and submerging her in it. And she believes truly that she's going to suffocate and die. And the sheer panic and fear on her face is so palpable and just sincerely disturbing that there are people, that there were people watching that in real time getting off on it. But that tank, because PD neglected safety protocols and the glass should have been thicker. So as that model was submerged, the glass shattered and she came pouring out of it. I mean, it could have killed both her and the other person standing in front of the tank, like the filmer. That easily, easily could have killed someone. He also began to ignore the hard limits of his models. In one clip, which was captured on camera, PD slapped model S4 hard across the face. And you immediately see her trauma response engage because that was her one sole hard limit. That was it. No slapping me. Through the tears, she reminds PD of this, but then he humiliates her because it was a live feed. He snarls at her saying, but the problem is I can't tell you every little thing that's going to happen. She doubles down on it being a limit and he argues with her and degrades her before finally relenting and agrees not to do it again. Multiple insects handlers and models also admit that Brent tried to pressure models into, quote, playing with him off camera. By that, he meant urinating on them and allowing him to have sex with them. He would tell them that he was feeling uninspired, but that if they played with him, he could use them as his muse. If they refused, he would make threats about their job security. It also became discouraged to use your safe word at all. It was considered a sign of weakness. One model, 1204, who was more of like the feminist and intellectual of the group, set her hard limit at anal sex. She'd never done it before, had no interest in it. During a live feed, JD used a metal dildo on a pole and violently anally penetrated her without lubricant. She said that she, quote, felt that she was raped, but she still never safe worded because she was scared to, because she knew that not only would she not be invited back for future jobs and it was a lot of money, but that at that point it was just, a, it was pride. Some of the sets for insects at this point were also becoming even more unsafe. They added, they built another water tank and added leeches to it so that models were completely suspended and restrained in the tank and leeches were actually attaching to them. They were on a farm. They had moved to a compound outside of New York in, just in the countryside and it was wintertime, and they did a whole series of women outside in the snow where they would be completely naked, attached to a pole or handcuffed or with a, uh, a collar on, literally knee deep in snow for a long time. One model in a barn was forced to stand, not over, but directly stand on a block of ice. And again, guys, remember that these women did in fact have the ability to safe word and get out of it. And around this time, if you recall, President George W. Bush campaigned in 2000 against the porn industry. That was, what was it, God, Guns, and Gays. So the porn industry was one of his big things, which is, you know, usually a conservative rallying point that it's corrupting the youth, so on and so forth. And this has been going on since, like, God, forever. And going against a $13 billion industry was pretty much an impossible task from the get-go. So the FBI began to focus on smaller operations. Because pornography could no longer be prosecuted under obscenity laws, the Department of Homeland Security under the Patriot Act determined that pornography was one of the main funnels used to fund terrorism. So they had the credit card companies start to drop all of these different websites. In 2005, the government used the Patriot Act to refuse PD the access to process credit cards because he was told violent porn sites were, again, known to funnel money to terrorists. So insects crumbled. The documentary shows all of these contraptions and machines that he had built were filled with cobwebs and dust. And that was insects. A, a bunch of them, like uh, Sid Black, PD, and a bunch of different models, went on to go to various different uh, fetish and kink websites, kink.com, uh, Hogtie, all of these random ones. But insects was gone. Literally, insects just completely came onto the scene, 
all of this, I mean, it literally made history in terms of society and culture on the in, in the history of the internet. And then it was just gone overnight. That was at just payments pulled. And this is a death knell. And this happened actually to a lot of different pornography sites online. Because if you think about it, even in 2021 with the internet, imagine that credit card capability was shut down on Netflix. And Netflix said, well, we can't process your credit card. So we need you to mail in a physical check, you know, wait the weeks for it to get here, wait a week for us to process it. And then after that, we will send you physically mail you a password to log in. So obviously people aren't going to do that. So insects died basically as quickly as it exploded into public consciousness. So we are going to end part one here today. There will be a part two going over crime statistics, psychological surveys and studies that have been done on the correlation between violent pornography and violent offenders. Again, you have been listening to We Saw the Devil. Until next crime.